Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. You know, the other day I was trying to draft an email, and like, well, like many of us, I reached for an AI tool that was incredibly fast, almost too fast, and it got me wondering, am I actually becoming um, less adept at writing or just more efficient? Am I getting smarter or perhaps a little softer? This exact tension is really at the heart of a recent, quite provocative article in The Economist titled, Does AI Make You Stupid? It raises a fascinating concern. Could these impressive AI shortcuts actually be creating a kind of hidden long-term debt, maybe secretly dulling our creativity, our memory, and uh, our critical thinking skills? Today, we're going beyond that headline. Our mission is to unpack the economists' arguments, scrutinize the evidence they cite, and crucially bring in the, well, the crucial counter-perspectives and information they largely omitted, hmm. really to give you a truly complete and nuanced understanding of AI's impact on our minds. So let's unpack this core premise. The economist's initial argument is quite stark, isn't it? It is. That when we use generative AI, we offload so much mental work that our cognitive muscles, as they put it, visibly slacken. They lean on three key studies to back up this idea of AI making our brains, well, a bit lazy. First, there's the MIT brain scan study using something called an EEG, which measures brain waves that looked at students writing essays with ChatGPT. They found less activity in the parts of the brain usually busy with deep thought, like the frontal and parietal regions. Plus, the students recalled fewer quotes from the essays they themselves had written. Then there was a Microsoft research survey. It found that 59% of AI-assisted tasks felt mindless, and a majority of workers reported needing less cognitive effort. Seems significant. And finally, Michael Gerlich's correlational work, which suggested heavy AI users scored lower on a critical thinking test. He even added that this observation resonates with what teachers are apparently seeing. That story is certainly attention grabbing. Yeah, it makes a good headline. After but what's truly interesting, I think, is that when you actually dig into the evidence, the picture is far more mixed than it initially appears. These studies definitely raise a red flag, uh, maybe a yellow one, but the conclusion isn't nearly as straightforward as AI makes you stupid. Hmm. Let's really look at that MIT brain scan study first. Yes. Okay, ChatGPT users showed lower brain activity and recalled fewer quotes, but there are significant limitations here. First off, it was a tiny sample, only 54 students. That's not much to generalize from. They have a very small. And it focused on one very specific kind of narrow speed writing task. More importantly though, lower neural activity doesn't automatically mean laziness. Think about it like driving a car. When you first learn, your brain is firing on all cylinders, lots of neural activity. No. But once you're experienced... And also automatic. Exactly. You can cruise along, maybe even chat or listen to music with far less conscious effort. That's neural efficiency, your brain becoming optimized, not lazier. As a commentary in Nature rightly pointed out, making big causal claims from this study is, well, premature. Okay, so efficiency versus laziness. That's a key distinction. What about the Microsoft survey? That 59% mindless figure sounds pretty damning. It does sound bad, but again, context matters. This was based purely on self-assessment, people saying it felt mindless, not objective metrics of actual cognitive load or task quality. Ah, self-reported. Yes. And critically, many of the examples given were, you know, low stakes chores, things workers chose to offload because they were rote and tedious to begin with. It's a bit like saying using a calculator for basic sums makes you mindless because you aren't doing long division on paper anymore. We offload simple stuff. That makes sense. And the girlish survey, the one linking heavy AI used to lower critical thinking scores. Right. The key point here, and it's a big one, is that this was just a correlation, a snapshot in time. It shows a link, not necessarily cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. Meaning it's like finding that people who own lots of fitness trackers tend to be healthier. Do the trackers make them healthier or do healthier people just like buying trackers? Right. The chicken or the egg. Exactly. We can't tell from this study if AI makes you a weaker thinker or if perhaps weaker thinkers simply tend to rely more heavily on AI tools in the first place. Reverse causality is a real possibility. So, okay, if these studies aren't the smoking gun proving AI makes you stupid, what are they telling us? Are they just early jitters about a new technology or is there something deeper going on? 
I think they certainly raise that flag, as you said. They highlight potential pitfalls in how we're currently using AI. Right. But they fall well short of proving that generative AI inherently erodes cognition across the board. What we're likely seeing were just snapshots of early adopter behavior, maybe some teething problems. Mm -hmm. It's not evidence of long-run neurological change. Precisely. And the real picture is far more complex. Which brings us to what The Economist article largely glossed over. Which is? The substantial counter-evidence showing how AI AI can actually boost our cognitive abilities when used differently. Okay, this sounds important. What kind of evidence? Well, for instance, there was a large field experiment published in Science Advances. It found that providing access to GPT-4 ideas actually made short stories more creative and better written. More creative, not less. More creative, yes. And interestingly, this boost was especially pronounced for creators who started out with lower baseline skills. So it can be an equalizer in a way. That's fascinating. What else? We also see findings from places like MIT Sloan and Tulane. Their studies show that large language model assistance lifts employee creativity, but, and this is a vital question it happens when users actively reflect on and iterate the prompts. So it's not just about getting an answer, but how you engage with the AI to get there. Exactly. Enough. Thinking of thinking skills, what researchers call metacognition, really seem to moderate the effect. It's about being intentional. Look at a randomized corporate trial in a tech consulting firm. Employees using GPT-4 produced solutions rated 12% more novel, significantly more innovative. Wow, 12%. But only if they were taught specific techniques, like using think aloud steps during the process. Just giving them the tool wasn't enough. So training and technique matter hugely. Immensely. And this is echoed in a broader synthesis by the OECD from June 2025. They reviewed 76 experiments. The conclusion, generative AI augments higher order skills like problem solving and creativity when tasks are scaffolded, when the AI helps guide you through steps. Well, there's always a but, isn't there? But they also noted that just doing rote one shot, prompting, you know, asking a simple question and taking the first answer can indeed narrow idea diversity. Okay, so that's a really crucial distinction emerging here. It seems AI can either sort of compress our thinking or expand it. That's a great way to put it. And it depends fundamentally on how we choose to engage with it. It's not a passive brain drain. It's much more of an interactive relationship. Absolutely. And this leads us to maybe re-examine some of the core, often unspoken assumptions behind that whole AI makes you stupid narrative. Like what? What, what are we assuming implicitly? We'll take the first one. Less brain activity equals worse thinking. We touched on this with the MIT study. As we discussed, neuroscience often interprets lower neural activation not as laziness, but as neural efficiency, especially once a skill becomes partially automated. Right, the experienced driver analogy. Exactly. The MIT study simply can't distinguish between cognitive slacking and cognitive optimization based on that EEG data alone. Okay, what's another assumption? Another is that cognitive miserliness our natural tendency to seek the least mentally effortful path is inherently a flaw we need to fight against. But isn't it sometimes smart to save mental energy? Precisely. Delegating mundane subtasks like, say, formatting bibliography references or checking grammar actually frees up our very limited working memory. That allows us to focus cognitive resources on higher level analysis, creativity, critical evaluation. Offloading is only really harmful if users also skip that crucial step of reflecting on, evaluating, and integrating the AI's output. So it's about what you offload and whether you still engage critically. Exactly. And the final big assumption, the fear that AI ideas homogenize output, making everything sound the same. Yeah, I hear that one a lot. Creativity research actually shows AI can function in two ways here. It can act as an anchor, yes, if users just passively accept the first suggestions it spits out, but it can also act as a springboard if users actively remix, critique, or build upon the AI suggestions. Ah, so it can actually spark more diverse ideas if used that way. Potentially, yes. So whether diversity falls or rises isn't purely a technological outcome. It's very much an instructional variable. It depends on how the user is guided or how they choose to engage. Okay. So this really reframes the whole debate, doesn't it? Mm. It's less about is AI good or bad for the brain and much more about... About how we interact with it. Right. It's not just if you use AI, but how you use it. This okay. really shifts the focus from sort of fearing the technology itself to designing better ways to interact with it and maybe training ourselves to engage more thoughtfully. Exactly. We need to move beyond these kind of blanket warnings and look at specific practical levers 
things in design, things in policy that can actually encourage more thoughtful AI engagement. What might those look like? Well, for example, people are prototyping thinking assistant chatbots. These are LLMs designed to ask you, the user, questions, Socratic prompts, essentially. So the AI prompts you to think deeper. Yes. And early results show these can improve decision quality in lab tasks. It flips the script a bit. Another promising approach is stepwise prompting, or sometimes called chain of thought audits, basically forcing users to articulate their reasoning process along the way. How does that help? It's been shown to reduce the AI making stuff up hallucinations and also improve learning and retention, for instance, in coding tutorials where people have to explain the steps. Even simple interface tweaks can make a difference. Microsoft researchers found that introducing just a 90 second time delay before users could act on AI suggestions for high stakes queries. Just a pause. Just a pause. It nudged users to actually skim the source documents the AI used, and it cut blind copy pasting by 27%. Little fictions can encourage reflection. That's clever. And you mentioned metacognition earlier. Yes. And training that is crucial. Remember the Tulane study? It showed that only employees who scored high on that thinking about thinking skill were able to convert GPT-4 assistance into real creativity games. So we need to teach people how to think effectively with AI, not just how to use the tool. Precisely. It's about building those cognitive skills alongside the technical ones. This feels much more constructive. Rather than just throttling AI access or being afraid of it, organizations and individuals could actually build these cognitive guardrails, as you called them, into workflows and actively upskill users. Now, to be fair, the Economist article itself wasn't entirely dismissive of solutions, was it? I recall it mentioning ideas like AI as an enthusiastic but somewhat naive assistant or those thinking assistants. That's true. They did touch on some of these promising ideas towards the end. But what was particularly revealing, I thought, even within The Economist's own reporting, were the real-world hurdles and complexities these solutions face. For instance, they cited an Abilene Christian University study showing that the AI providing provocations to challenge thinking actually degraded performance for weaker coders. So it's not a one-size-fits-all fix. Ah, so help for some could be hindrance for others. Potentially. And frankly, there's the basic human factor. People often don't like being forced into extra cognitive effort. These cognitive forcing functions can be unpopular. Meaning people just try to get around them. Exactly. Which leads to high demand for workarounds. One survey they mentioned showed 47% of respondents would likely use AI tools even if their workplace explicitly forbade it. Wow. So the desire for the shortcut is strong. Very strong. So while these design and training solutions are promising, implementing them effectively against that current of convenience seeking faces real human behavior challenges. Ultimately, as we try to really get a handle on AI's long-term cognitive impact, there are still just so many unanswered questions. We're still in the early days. Like what? What are the big unknowns? Well, we really need longitudinal neuroimaging studies. Are repeated AI-assisted tasks actually rewiring our attention networks over years or just causing temporary shifts in activation patterns? We don't know yet. We need proper education pilots. Do classrooms that explicitly teach reflective prompting techniques consistently outperform AI-free classrooms over a full semester or year, especially in developing critical thinking? And in the workplace. Yeah, in the labor market, does heavy AI reliance correlate with future wage growth or career progression after you control for baseline metacognitive ability? That's a key question for a long-term impact. Right. And answering these critical questions, it sounds like it will require much bigger samples, years-long follow-ups. Exactly. None of which really exist yet in a robust way. So much of our current discussion, including those alarming headlines, is still based on pretty early, often limited observations. That's the state of play, yes. Lots of speculation based on preliminary data. So what's the upshot of all this for you listening right now? Where does this leave us? The bottom line, as we've explored today, seems to be that, yes, early studies do show these pockets of cognitive slack, especially when AI is treated purely as an autopilot, a shortcut machine. But the stronger, more nuanced evidence suggests that with the right approach, reflective prompts, well-designed interfaces, conscious effort generative AI can actually amplify both creativity and critical thinking. I think that's right. The technology itself isn't inherently a mind eraser. The real risk lies in mindless use using it without thinking. And if you think about it, we've heard variations on this story before, haven't we? How so? Well, Socrates famously feared that the invention of writing would atrophy people's memory. 
Later, calculators were predicted to doom basic numeracy skills. Ah, the historical parallels. Right. And in both of those cases, what proved decisive wasn't banning the technology. It was pedagogy, how we learn to integrate and use the tool effectively. Education, not prohibition. I suspect AI will be no different. It's about learning how to use it well. That's a powerful way to frame it. So maybe the final thought for you as you consider integrating AI more into your own work and life is to ask yourself not just the easy question, can AI do this task for me? But perhaps the more important one, how can I use this AI to help me think better?